Micah, I'd like you to repeat after me. I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And because of your confession, I baptize you in the name of the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Great put your hands in the mouth. Welcome to Broadway Christian Church. We're so glad you joined us. We would love for you to fill out a Connect card. This card is a great way to sign up for our communications, update your information, or to let us know how we can pray for you this week. If you fill out this card, we'll probably have a dance party. If you are joining us for the first time, I want to invite you to bring this card by our Next Steps area after the service so we can meet you and give you a gift. One of the ways you can worship at Broadway is by giving. Giving is a response to who Jesus is and what he's done. It's also a great way to share the message of Jesus with others so that they may find hope in him and a home in his church. And when people find hope in Christ and a home in his church, it makes us want to dance. If you'd like to give today, you can place your offering in the boxes on the wall by the exits. Go to our website or text a dollar amount to 84321. Ladies, don't forget our upcoming women's event, Her Story. Sharing the truth of his story is just around the corner. This mini retreat is a great opportunity to grow closer in your relationship with God and other women. We'll laugh, we'll cry, and we'll enjoy hearing from women in the Broadway family share their stories of life change in their walk with Jesus. And after that, we might even dance. Let yourself be reminded that God loves us and we all have the privilege of being part of His story. This event takes place from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., but you can also be a part of these optional activities. Yoga from 8 to 9 a.m. and or for dessert from 2 to 3 p.m. The event cost is $15 and lunch is included. Childcare is free. Bring a friend. We hope to see you there. To register for Her Story or any other event, Visit the events page at broadwaycc.org or stop by Next Steps after the service. Today we are beginning our series, Will You Grow? A biblical, spiritual, and inspirational initiative designed to enrich our understanding of Christian stewardship. We will continue to explore that wherever we are in our lives, God doesn't want us to stay there. We may even discover that he wants us to dance. Everybody. Now you may be tempted to think that was CGI. It was not. It was glow sticks taped onto black clothes. That's actually their dance moves. <laughs> Do with that what you will. It, grab a Bible, open it up to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians 8. As many of you know, several years ago, John Muth and I after having served together for a decade at a church in the St. Louis area, left together and we moved our families to the greater Boston area to start a new church from scratch. And the, the primary responsibility that John and I had in those early days in that first year was fundraising. Now, that, that makes obvious sense. There was no congregation uh, we were so talented at our jobs, we went to a church of zero. 
There's no congregation to pool its resources to fund the ministry and the ministers of the church, so we had to raise outside funds. So for months on end, he and I traveled sometimes together, and a lot of times separately, uh, all around the country to meet with groups of elders, to meet with missions teams, to meet with preachers, to meet with individuals in those churches to let them know here's what th this work that God has called us to and we want you to partner with us in that. To this day, now six years later, I can still give that spiel in my sleep because I gave it hundreds of times to individuals and groups of people about the church. And we, we raised commitments for four years and f fully funded that church for four years. God was very faithful in all of that. But in the years since then, the number one question that I have received about that experience is, how in the world could you do fundraising like that? How in the world could you travel and go into a church you've never been in before, sit in front of a group of elders or a missions team that you've never met before, and give them this spiel and ask them for very large amounts of money. Just, we're, we're talking six figures of commitment that we're asking these individuals and churches to make to the church. How could you do that? Oh, I, can, I just can't imagine. I could never uh, you know, rely on those raised funds. I could never go into an environment like that and ask someone for money. The fact of the matter, though, is it was easy. It was easy for a couple of reasons. One, uh, because it was necessary unless we wanted to live in our car. So that really has some motivation behind it. But secondly, the reason it was easy is because we believed in it. We believed in the critical importance of what we were doing. That what we did mattered, not just to us, not just to the people in Quincy, Massachusetts. It mattered to the kingdom of God and therefore it should matter to you. And it was easy to invite you then to partner with us, to, to join us in something that matters so very much. For the next few weeks, we are going to unapologetically talk about money and generosity. And it won't be hard at all because what we do matters. What we do as God's people, what we do gathered together as God's people in this church in particular matters. It matters to us as individuals. It matters to our community. It matters around the world. So we will very simply, very easily invite you to be a part of something that matters so greatly. We're gonna open up some text together. We're gonna anchor mostly in 2 Corinthians chapters eight and nine. We're gonna see what God has to say about this critical area of life and we're gonna see how generosity impacts our lives individually for terms of personal growth, for our benefit, what God does in us when we're generous. But we're also gonna see how that affects the church corporately as a group. And we're gonna present some information to you and put some tools into your hands over the next few Sundays that will accomplish two things. They will provide for us a picture of reality because we don't operate in the land of fantasy, we operate in the land of reality, of how things actually are. And secondly, they will issue for us a challenge, one that I am confident we will rise to meet. Because when you look at what the Bible teaches about giving, about generosity, about personal financial practices, what you find is that the Bible's teaching is very practical, very helpful. Principles like you need to live within your means. If you spend more than you bring in, that's not just something that you know, financial gurus talk about. God talks about that. That's foolish. You need to live within your means. The, the fact that debt cripples and is a form of slavery. The, the Bible is clear across the board. It, it will speak of the wisdom of saving and why it's important to set money aside for the sake of opportunities that God will provide for you. And it speaks of the power of generosity and what it does in your life, what it does in the lives of the people around you. Biblical teaching on money is very practical, but biblical teaching on money is also deeply theological. 
It's not just a, 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 ste- a, a you know, set of practical steps for you to take, but behind all of that are these incredible truths about who God is, about who he's made us to be, and how to live in response to those things. Here is one of the biblical conclusions that we can draw, the theological conclusion about generosity. Here it is. You cannot be Christ-like without generosity. There is no other way to say it. You cannot be Christ-like without generosity. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. That's an incredible verse. That's one of the, the handful of verses throughout the New Testament that has the gospel in a sentence. You don't have to go outside of that verse at all to understand the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Though it's in the context of finances and generous giving of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, this is a verse not about Jesus' personal wealth, but about how he patterned his life and what he did for you. Though he had it all, though he was rich, the the eternal glory of heaven, he gave all of that up for the benefit of others. And now you, by his poverty, by his giving up of all that he had, you now greatly benefit and go from nothing to having everything because Jesus gave it to you. You held an unimaginable debt standing before God. Your sin created that debt and that separation from him. But by the work of Jesus outlined in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, He gave up himself, he gave up his life so that you, who had nothing, could have everything. So that you, instead of having debt before God, would have a rich relationship with God. Though you would fall under the condemnation of death, now because of Jesus, you have the hope of eternal life. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Thereby he's left for us a pattern to follow. An example to follow. You cannot be Christ-like without generosity. Generosity models Christ-likeness. It it shows who Jesus is and what he's done. Generosity also fosters Christ-likeness. It pushes us further and further down that road of becoming more like him. So to grow in this area of generosity is to grow in Christ-likeness. To grow in generosity is to grow in your faith. To grow in generosity is to grow in spiritual maturity. So will you grow? And what we're gonna do for the next few minutes together is really simple. We're simply gonna analyze the question. Will you grow? Because this is a loaded question. So, number one. This is a question of motivation, not ability. Will you grow? We're not asking, can you grow? We're not asking, should you grow? We're asking, will you grow? It's a question of motivation, not ability. So then, therefore, the underlying question before us is this. Is there sufficient motivation to grow in the area of personal generosity? What what motivation is there to push us forward to grow in this? Well, there's generosity itself with what generosity is and what it does. So if you grow in generosity, generosity models Christ-likeness. That's certainly motivation. What generosity does, it fosters Christ-likeness. That's certainly motivation. It helps us to become more like him. And then we discover as we continue to read the text that generosity makes us like God. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world, he gave because this is what he does out of his love for us he gives to us we can say all day long how much we love it's empty until we give because love gives 
So is there sufficient motivation? Generosity itself, becoming more and more like God? I would add to this list the mission of our church. The church that you have chosen to anchor in to become your spiritual home. Listen, no, nobody gets to make that decision for you. You have to make that decision for yourself. Oh, you, know, you, you put on your big boy pants and your big girl pants this morning and this is the church you chose to come to. This is the church you chose to make your home. This church has declared that here's how we frame up the reason why we exist and, and what we do. It's simply a, a restatement of how Jesus put the mission of the church in the Great Commission. We say we, we exist to help people find hope in Christ and a home in his church. Because you know, when preachers come up with statements like that, they, they come up with statements like that that are alliterative and they sound, you know, they're, they're parallel. That's what we preachers do. We just can't help it. Uh, hope in Christ and a home in his church. It's second nature. So is that worthy of our commitment to grow in the area of generosity, to help people find hope in Christ? Because we believe to our bones that people will live a hopeless life without Christ, that there's an emptiness there. We believe to our bones that without Christ, people will go into a Christless eternity. That, that should matter. There's, there's some weight to that. But it's not just hope in Christ, it's also a home in his church to provide for people a spiritual home, a spiritual family that are referred to in scripture as brothers and sisters in Christ. We're in this thing together, an environment that welcomes them, that challenges them, that encourages them. A lot of people don't have that environment. They don't have that family around them that welcomes them that doesn't judge them, that is offering challenge and encouragement. So is there sufficient motivation to grow in the area of generosity? What generosity is and what it does, the fact that we become more like God, the mission of this church in general, there, there is profound levels of motivation to grow. So this is a question of motivation, not ability. Secondly, this is a question of personal application. Will you grow? We're not asking you to be concerned about anybody's generosity but your own. It's nobody else's business. It's not your business what they give or don't give. Will you grow? Because you need to be concerned about you. Several years ago, the church that John and I served together, uh, we're getting ready for a capital campaign. Capital campaign is an initiative in a church where you raise crazy amounts of money to do fun things. And we, we did several capital campaigns over the 10 years at that church. And it's, it's not an easy thing to stand before people and ask for millions of dollars. And that particular campaign was asking for a little over $6 million over the course of two years. It's a lot to ask. We were building buildings we were remodeling existing buildings. We were opening up campuses. We were doing all kinds of fun things in the community and giving hundreds of thousands of dollars away. It was super fun. But before you do something like that, you want to make sure the church is ready for something like that. You don't just go into a group of people and say, hey, my name's Ian. We need $6 million. You have to get ready for those kinds of things. So we, we took a survey in the church called the TCI, the Transforming Church Index. It's a church health survey. Because what happens if you begin to do initiatives like that and, and raise crazy amounts of money, if there are some cracks in the foundation of the health of that church, when you try to add millions of dollars onto that, those cracks become craters and it blows up the church. So we wanted to make sure is the church ready for all of this. So we took this survey and we were thrilled with the results. What was so encouraging about those results is it told us very clearly people are thrilled with the church. They are happy with what the church is doing, where the church is, and, and really how could they not be? It had grown exponentially and there were multiple baptisms every week and hundreds of people were coming to Christ every year and were opening up all these new things and doing all these new initiatives. People were thrilled with the church. They were thrilled that it was 
reaching the lost. They were thrilled that it was serving. They were thrilled that it was so generous with its financial resources. They were thrilled. Now, at the same time, there was another line of information that came our way that was very discouraging. That while people were very excited about the church and what it was doing, they were not personally involved in any of those things. It was a strange phenomenon. So here's how it went. I'm thrilled to be part of a church that's reaching the lost. I am not personally reaching the lost at all, but I'm so glad to sit in a room filled with people who are. I'm thrilled to be a part of a church that's serving in its community. I don't do that, but I'm so glad you do. I'm thrilled to be part of a church that, that gives financial resources away and helps people so tremendously. I'm not doing that. I'm a greedy, wretched piece of garbage that doesn't give a penny, but I'm so glad that you are. That really wasn't one of the questions in the survey. <laughs> that was just how we interpreted it. Thrilled with the church, but not personally participating in it. So here's the thing. The elders and the staff of this church could get together in a room and with a whiteboard and we could draw up strategic plans and, and we could talk about org charts and we could talk about all, all the things that we're gonna do and we could build an organization that you would be proud to be part of. You would be thrilled to be a part of a church that was doing all of the things that we would ensure that it was doing. That's never the point. It is never the point for church leaders to build an organization. This is not an organization. This is a living, breathing body of people, a family that's on mission together. It's not the point to build an organization that you're a part of because that would be dangerous. Be dangerous for you personally as a follower of Jesus because as a church, as an organization, we could reach the lost without you ever talking about your faith with a non-Christian. We could serve in the community without you ever sacrificing some of your time to serve. We could give away hundreds of thousands of dollars without you ever giving a penny. Let me ask you, does that build a church? No. That builds a benevolent organization in our community. That is not a church. A church is made up of a bunch of individuals. No matter that si the size of that church, whether it's 50 or 50,000, that church is made up of individuals and the power of that church, the effectiveness of that church is determined by those individuals. This is not an organization that does all of these things that you get to be a part of that by your presence here on a Sunday, oh wow, look at, look at all that we're doing. This is what happens in sports, as a sports phenomenon, that you know, whatever your team is, whether it's baseball, football, college, whatever, you have this team that you root for and you wear their, their jerseys and you pay attention to every, you watch every single game and you know the stats of all the players and you know their social security numbers and their bank account numbers and you know, their addresses because you're, you're a creeper and, and all of that. What happens when your team wins? Do you know what you say? We won. Where's the we in that equation? Were you on the field playing? No, you were sitting in your house on your couch in your jammy pants with your jersey on watching the game on your big screen TV. You didn't win diddly squat. But we find our identity in that organization. Oh yeah, we won. Oh, that was a bad day for us, we lost. You didn't win and you didn't lose. You didn't do anything. People can come together and call it a church and say, look at all that we're doing. We aren't doing anything because you're sitting and doing nothing, because there are leaders who are sitting and doing nothing. That, that's not a church. A church is a group of people on mission together as a family of believers. This is not a faceless crowd. You, as the people who come to this church, are not a means to an end. You're not the means by which this organization accomplishes its goals. You are the goals. You are this body of believers. 
So you need to concern yourself with your own participation, with your own level of generosity, not others. And the reason we have to talk about this is because in about eight minutes, you're going to be really tempted to concern yourself with other people's generosity. Because the information we're going to present to you is going to poke at that, and you're going to want to. Don't. Because what someone else gives is none of your business. What someone else gives is between them and the Lord, and what you give is between you and the Lord. Concern yourself with you. It's a question of personal application. And number three, it's a question of movement forward. Will you grow? It's movement forward. You know, we, we have built within us this natural intuition, this natural desire to grow. You know, think of athletes. When they begin to play a sport, they automatically want to get better at that sport. They don't say, you know what, this is the first time I've ever played this. I'm good. I, I want to play at this level the rest of my life. You, you won't last long in that sport if that's what you do. There, there's this natural desire, I, I, I want to get better at this. I want to be more effective at this. When you get a new job, when you go in on your first day and you're trying to figure out the ins and the outs of how this works, how that works, you don't go hope at the end of the day and say, I, I have it made. You know what I'm going to do until I retire? Nothing. <laughs> I'm just going to hang out here and do exactly what I did today. And when I turn 65, it's, I'm finished. It's all over. You won't last long in that job if you do that. Those are the ones that get fired, and rightly so. It's just not how it works. We naturally want to get better, to get more effective. When you start a new relationship, you naturally want that relationship to grow. When you get married, you don't go home from your marriage ceremony and go, all right, we're done. I don't have to know another single thing about you the rest of our days. We don't ever have to have another conversation. Our dates are finished. This is all over. We're now just in the same house together. Some kids will come along eventually. The store's gonna drop them off because we will never develop this relationship at all from this day forward. That wasn't in the vows. You naturally want the relationship to grow. You wanna know this person deeper and better. You want to experience them in new and exciting ways. You want that day, the day your relationship began, to be the day that you love them the least because every day you will love them a little bit more because you get to know them a little bit more. Where does that come from? That there is this natural intuition to grow. God wired that into your soul because this is a spiritual reality. Now, we have a phrase that we use here and you've heard me say, if you've been here any time at all, you've heard me say it numerous times that sums up God's desire for us in terms of growing. Wherever you are, God doesn't want you there. Some of you need to get that tattooed on you somewhere. <laughs> and if you do, please send me a picture because that would be awesome. <laughs> Wherever you are, God doesn't want you there. I know people who've taken that phrase, put it on a bumper sticker and put it on their car. Wherever you are, he doesn't want you there. Wherever you are in terms of your faith, he doesn't want you there. Wherever you are in terms of your marriage, he doesn't want you there. Wherever you are in terms of your giving, he doesn't want you there. Wherever you are in terms of your Bible knowledge, he doesn't want you there. Because God never looks at us and says, perfect, you're done. There's always another way to grow. Wherever you are, God doesn't want you there. Hebrews chapter six it says, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and move on to maturity. Second Peter chapter one, one of my favorite texts about this reality. Here's what it says, starting in verse three. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, verse five, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, and 
Knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Verse eight, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's given to you everything that you need to honor him in your life. He's provided for you your faith, its realities, all the promises that back up your faith. He's given you everything that you need. Your responsibility is to put it all together. Your responsibility is to take your faith and add to it. Supplement it with these qualities and that quality and this initiative and that characteristic. And this wonderful truth, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, you're growing, you are developing. They will keep you, there's, there's a direct effect, they will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful. I don't know any Christian who says, here's my goal in, in the faith. I wanna be ineffective and unfruitful for Jesus. Praise his name. <laughs> no one does that. No one says, I wanna be a waste for God's kingdom. We want to be effective, we want to be productive, we want to be fruitful. This is how we do it. We grow. We take step after step after step after step so that we can continue to be effective and fruitful. So will you grow? In particular, in this area of personal generosity, because of what generosity is and because of what generosity does. So let me talk to the, the two extremes in the room because in so doing, everybody else will get caught up in the middle of it. In, in terms of your level of giving, in terms of your level of personal generosity, let me speak first of all to those who are at one end of the spectrum who don't give at all, who give nothing, or their, their giving is so minor in their life, not, not because of an amount, but because it's not intentional. You don't think about it. You don't pray about it. You don't care about it. It's just something that you do on the Sundays you happen to be here. Whatever's in your pocket, that's, it's an afterthought at best. So to those on that end of the spectrum that giving is not a thing for them for whatever reasons, maybe it's because you're new, this church is new to you, and in the last year, we've had a tremendous wave of new people calling this church home. It's unlike anything we've experienced in recent history as a church. It is really fun. It is really exciting. We are so glad that you're here. And what we know when, when people start coming to a new church is their money is the last thing to come with them. And if they get upset, it's the first thing to go away. Just it's the way it is, how, how this works. So maybe you're new here and you haven't come to this point yet of, of engaging financially. We, we get that. Or, or maybe you're here, you're not necessarily new anymore, but you haven't come to this point of engaging with the life of the church. You haven't gotten beyond an hour in this room on a Sunday. You're not in a group, you're not serving anywhere. Again, giving isn't really a thing. You're not developing relationships with people here. You're not giving for those reasons. Or maybe you're not giving at all because you're living in quiet rebellion. Maybe it's rebellion against the church. Oh man, I don't like that Ian guy. I, I, don't, like, I don't like the decisions that uh, the leadership is making. I don't like this or I don't like that, so I'll show them. You, you can do that. Again, no one can make you do anything. Or maybe you're in quiet rebellion against the Lord himself. It's not the church. It's God. That your response to all of this, though you may not articulate it out loud because you haven't even thought through it to that point, that, yeah, I understand what God says about all these other areas, and I understand, but hands off the money. It's too personal. Who are you to tell me what I can and can't do or should and shouldn't do with my money? So to those on that end of the spectrum, for whatever reason you're there, God doesn't want you there, period. He doesn't want you there. He wants you to continue to grow, whatever that looks like. So what we're gonna call you to do over the next few weeks is to take a step, one step, that's it. To go from giving nothing to giving something. Well, that's about as easy and generic as it can come, right? Go from nothing to something. No one's asking you to go from 0% to 75% of your income from one Sunday to the next. I mean, if you'd like to, we can talk. <laughs> go from nothing 
to something. Take a step in the direction God would have you to go. Let me talk to those on the other end of the spectrum. Those that the Bible would title as tithers. Now, a tither is someone who gives 10% of their income. You don't tithe 20 bucks unless you make 200. Okay? Tithe is 10% or more. And there are numerous families in this church who are so very generous and they are so sacrificial. There are a bunch of people in that category. They're on the other end of that spectrum that they are, they're giving a large amount percentage-wise of their income. The amount is inconsequential. It's percentage. So let me ask you this. Is your giving still challenging you? Is your giving still changing you? There's nothing magical about a certain percentage. There's nothing magical about a 10% where God would say, done, you're perfect, all set, don't think about this again. That's never the case. So, so if you're on that end of the spectrum, God doesn't want you there. Because there's always a way to grow. That's the point. In whether we're talking about generosity or any other area, this is always the point. Will you grow? Will you acknowledge where you are and then take some steps in the direction the Lord would have you to go? Now, in a minute, John is gonna come out and he's gonna do this every single week. He's gonna come out and he's gonna provide you some information and introduce some tools that we're gonna put in your hands to help in this regard. But let me just say for us together, will you grow? That's a powerful question. That's a loaded question. This is the question that undergirds our faith. Will you take what the Lord has given you and add to it? Supplement your faith so that you would be effective and fruitful for the sake of the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the chance to open it together and have you speak. We know that it's uncomfortable to talk about giving. It's uncomfortable to talk about money. People get all bent out of shape at times because it's so very personal. But there's nothing off limits to you, ever. You get to root yourself right in there because those belong to you. All of those things, our lives themselves belong to you. So God, as we, over the next few weeks, simply open up ourselves and our church to you. We ask for you to move. We ask for you to show us what generosity is and what it does. It's power in our lives and in the church and around the world. And we ask that you would help us to take a step, to continue to grow because that honors you. Thank you for Jesus who shows us what generosity is. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. See ya. Bye, buddy. Anyway, so every now and again, my wife and I have to sit down and talk about money. And you may be able to re relate to this. It's never really that fun. I mean, it's not something we look forward to. Hey, honey, we'd have a conversation about money later. Yes. We do that because it's necessary. We do that because it's healthy. We need to be on the same page. And sometimes we have to make some tough decisions. You know, I, I can count on one hand the number of times. We've been married 16 years. On one hand, the number of times that conversation was fun. And it was because we had some extra money that we got to figure out what to do with. And looking back, we probably shouldn't have spent it the way that we decided to spend it. But this is what we get to do for the next several weeks. We get to have uh, a few f family meetings about money. And is it going to be fun? Not necessarily. But is it necessary and is it healthy? Absolutely. And if, if it's your first time here on this Sunday, of all Sundays, I'm glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. Because you get to see a side of church that you don't always get to see. We're, we're a family. Ian said this. We are a family. And around here, we, we help bear each other's burdens. We offend each other. And we do our best to forgive one another. Sometimes we have tough conversations with each other. And we do our best to, to love God and to love one another. So when you leave today, you're going to receive a couple things. One of, one of them is this, this little pamphlet. 
And somewhere inside it, you'll, you'll probably read this, it says it's not about a budget, it's about a relationship. And I've been thinking about that this week. And that is, that is absolutely true. As Ian said, the focus of this series, Will You Grow, is much, it's much bigger than money. It's much bigger than a budget. But as we've recently had to make some significant budget cuts, our budget absolutely matters. Our budget represents our prayers. It represents our dreams for the future and for, for next year especially. Our budget represents accountability. And it represents our ability, our ability to minister to people well. And that matters. Our budget should accurately reflect our mission of helping people find hope in Christ and a home in His church. So I'm not ashamed to say that we need you to take this question, we need you to grapple with this question and take this seriously because it greatly affects you and your walk with the Lord, and it greatly affects our ministry here. Now, Ian warned you that you're going to have the temptation, oh, there it is, you're going to have the temptation to compare yourself to others, and he was talking about this chart. I know you have to squint to see it, so don't, don't even try. You're going to get this as you leave today, too. But it represents the number of individuals or families who give between a, a range of a different ranges of, of amounts. And the point of this chart, again, is not for comparison. It's to show that everybody gives something, even if that's nothing. And it's meant to give you an accurate picture of reality and to see the challenge that we have of, of growing. So if, if, and if also, if you're not sure where you fit on this chart, we're going to be emailing uh, some giving statements this week so that you can see where you're at. No matter where you are on this chart, it's, it's not your position that, that matters. It's your commitment to grow that matters. Because, again, because of what it does for you and because of what it does for the ministry of this church. And I know this can be uncomfortable. This can, can be a scary thing to, to pray and think about. It's one of those things that, you know, I'm going to pray about this and I'm afraid that God's going <laughs> to answer that prayer. I don't know what God's going to move you to do. I don't. But what I do know is that, as Ian said, God doesn't want you where you are. He wants to transform your life. He wants you to experience more hope, more joy, more peace, more love, and more of Him than you think is even possible. Back to 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you by His poverty might become rich. What an incredible reminder of the generosity of Jesus. He gave all that he had for you and for me. And that is the reason, that is the reason that we grapple with this question. It's not because I get up here and share with you a chart. It's, it's because God loves you so much. And that is the motivation, that is the fuel for asking this, que this question about growth, that's what we need to have in our minds as, as we pray for God to help us with this, as, as we respond to God in worship, and as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus through communion. We take communion every week and we're reminded of the great love of Jesus. So in a minute, I'm going to pray, and then let's take some time to remember that, that though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor, so that we by his poverty might become rich. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful for your great love. God, left on my own, I know that God, I already do screw a lot of things up, but my life would be a mess. So God, thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for what you've done in the lives of the people in this room, what you've done in them, what you've done through them. Thank you for the challenge of growth. God, and, and the joy we'll experience as we do. So God, now as we remember that you gave your body, as you bore the weight of our sin on your shoulders on a cross, God, that may this be a staggering reminder, God, that you don't want us where you are, that you went to such great lengths to be able to call us your own, for us to have a relationship with you. God, that, that you want us to move, that you want us to, to move in deeper, to move in 
closer to you. So would you help us with that today and this week? We praise you and we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad you spent time with us today and we hope that you were encouraged. Remember to connect with us by using the form at broadwaycc.org. Have a great week and don't, don't forget, forget to, to dance. dance.